One, two, three. Hallelujah. Clap for the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Let's all be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for blessing us to be here this morning. We thank you for giving us yet another opportunity to sit at your feet and to receive fresh rhema from heaven. I bind the work of the devil right now in the name of Jesus, that there be no distractions, but that your word would go forth and accomplish that which you sent it to. We thank you, Lord, and we surrender to the power of the Holy Ghost now in Jesus name. Amen. Church said amen. amen. Praise God. All right, look at your neighbor and say, get your Bible out. Praise the Lord. God's got something in store for you, amen. amen. All right, so uh, as we are preparing, you know, once again, we got uh, Easter Sunday next Sunday. We call it Resurrection Sunday as we celebrate that resurrection um, but we know along the way, God's just got great things in store for us. And so um, I'm going to preach this message this morning entitled Fishers of Men, Fishers of Men. And we are all responsible. Amen. Amen. Look at your name and say, we are all responsible. We are all responsible. So now once you step into Christianity, this is what I want you to understand about Christianity. You understand that Christianity uh, started out as a movement with the intention of taking over the world. Y'all in here with me. It never started out as a movement which was, well, if you want to participate, fine. If not, fine. No, this was introduced as the only way. Amen. And Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, what? But by me, John 14, 6. And so if we understand this, we say, there's no other way. But then a lot of the arguments that come up today is, well, what about the people who believe this? What about the people who believe that? Well, you know, don't all roads lead to heaven? That would be a no, because Jesus says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And so when we step into this, now we become Christians. Did you know that your Christianity was not just about you? So when you get saved, now all of a sudden you just became of a part of this movement has been taking over the world. You know, this whole thing started with 120 people in the upper room in the book of Acts. Think about this, how many Christians we have in the world and it started with 120 people. Why? Because there's the power of multiplication and the whole thing is about growth. And so let's go to Matthew, Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, we'll look at this in the King James and then the Amplified. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 20. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. So let's go to this uh, and straightway. Uh, and they straightway left their nets and followed, followed him. And so now let's look at this in the Amplified Classic on this. He was walking, speaking to Jesus, he was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He noticed two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, throwing a dragnet into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, come after me. But then what does he say? Go ahead. And, that's OK. Y'all can read it. That's why we got these boards. Amen. This, these boards ain't for y'all to just look at it. Sometimes you got to read it. Yeah. So he says, come after me as disciples. Now, look at this. What's the next part say? Letting me be your guide. Wait, but but you, you mean I got to let Jesus lead me? Yeah, because man has a free will. I mean, oh, he's not going to make you do anything. 
He, you know, Jesus ain't going to make you get up and go to church. He ain't going to make you pay your tithes. He ain't going to make you live clean. He ain't going to make you stop this and stop that. He ain't going to make you. He will give you the opportunity and he will help you. But he says, come after me as disciples, letting me be your guide. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and became his disciples, sided with his party and followed him. And so they came into agreement with Jesus. And so if we break down what the scripture is telling us, he says, come after me as disciples, letting me be your guide. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is a person who is a pupil or an adherent to the doctrines of another, a follower. And so it's like Jesus is saying, you know, we know in Amos it says, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Well, you know, there's no debate with Jesus. Now, you may have some discussions with your spouse or with your family members, and you can come to a place where you say, OK, I can understand your side of this. OK, you understand my side. OK, we're coming to like a healthy compromise here. Yeah, y'all in here with me. Uh, see, so it's a give and take. And all. that's not the way it works with Jesus. Y'all OK with that? I think people have been teaching Jesus. They've been teaching the wrong Jesus. They've been teaching a Jesus to where you can have Jesus and still have everything you want. You can have Jesus and still do everything you want. There's a lot of people that say they love Jesus, but they ain't giving up nothing. I mean, it, it ain't like he going to say, you know, man, we're not trying to have people give everything up like overnight. But man, you've been following Jesus for 10 years and you still doing all that craziness. At some point, something's got to change. Y'all in here with me. But see, if, but if we don't teach it right, then there will be no change. Why? There'll be people going to church and they, they said, well, they love Jesus, but they forgot about this part. He says, let me be your guide. Huh? Let me be your guide. Well, then you got to look at what you're doing in your life. Well, did Jesus lead me to do that? Y'all in here, come on. See, this is what this is about. This is what Christianity is about. He says, let me be your guide. Uh, come after me as disciples. Um, let me be your guide. So if you want to be led, he will lead you. Amen. Do you know he'll help you through any situation? Yes. Do you know that he'll show you how to make the right decision when you don't even have the knowledge base to make the right decision? Come on, somebody. But if you would surrender, sacrifice, let yourself go and let him be your guide. See, that's what it is to be a disciple. Now, you know why Christianity multiplied and spread is because they stuck to these principles. See, when these guys came out of the upper room, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And I mean, no, that's a big problem in the church today. Uh, half the people in the body of Christ ain't even filled with the Holy Ghost. And so let alone they uh, know how to follow. How are you gonna follow God? You don't even have the Holy Ghost working in your life. And so they haven't surrendered. Because listen, logic keeps you from surrendering to the Holy Ghost. If you stay bound by logic, you're going to be stuck according to what you've learned, what you've been exposed to. But the Holy Ghost will take you somewhere you've never been. Yeah. And he'll empower you to do some stuff you've never done. Come on, how I many know there's some people that have been addicted to things and got delivered in one day? Amen. There's one day everything, it's like, wait, what happened to that desire? Gone. And, and then there's some other people struggling. They can't shake it. They can't shake it. Come after me and let me be your guide. Don't just be going around talking about, I go to church. Who cares? Does the world see Jesus in you? That's what this is about. Because now when people see someone, you know, Paul was so radically changed that when Paul first started preaching, they were scared to hear him preach. Y'all in here with me. They say, wait, hold on. You preaching Jesus now, but last week you was arresting us for, for worshiping Jesus. And now you're talking about you want to preach at our church? <laughs> but see, that's the radical transformation that comes through the presence of God. So he said unto them, come after me as disciples, let me be your guide. 
follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so let me be your guide. Let's go to Psalm 32, 8. Now, there's there's uh, sometimes pressure that we put on ourselves and we think that we have to figure out this and figure out that we don't have to figure out anything. He's going to do it through us. He says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in a way in which thou shalt go and I will guide thee with my eye. And so we can depend on this guidance. And then John 14, 26, go over there John, in the Amplified Classic, John 14, 26. He says, but the comforter. So this is how God does it. It's the Holy Spirit. He releases the Holy Spirit. So when you get saved, how many of y'all saved up in here? Amen. Man, if you don't answer that fast. Come on, what do I say, huh, Pastor? No. You better answer that quick, man. You got to know that. See, saved means I, I gave my life to Jesus. Yeah. Saved means I don't own this no more. Right. You know what I'm saying? Saved does not mean I said a prayer in 1975. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'd have met some people and I asked them, you know, um, I'd ask some people, are you saved? They said, what does that mean? See, when, if they say, what does that mean? They ain't saved. But then you ask some other people, say, you ever met these people? And they say, oh, you know, you believe in God? Oh, yeah, I was baptized. How old were you, 12? Man, but you've been gang banging and slanging drugs. Watch out. <laughs> Come on. And, and, but you, but you were Jesus. Oh, yeah, my family's Baptist. But what are you? Right. And so this is all about a personal relationship with God. And so he comes upon you. Now, if you be willing. He will guide you. So what happens is a person gets saved. So you come to the end of yourself. Y'all anybody. Oh, man. All of y'all at least said the sinner's prayer, didn't you? Come on. I know you at least just say it after service when we say it. I mean, I mean. But so what happens is you come to the end of yourself. So what people come to the altar is a representation of death to self. And so you come, the only reason a person comes to the end of themselves is it ain't working for them no more. Amen? It just ain't working. You know, I don't know about you guys, but that's kind of, that's what happened to me. You know, my old ways of doing things just wasn't working. And so you come to the end of yourself. And then you say, I give my life to Jesus. Now, maybe you don't know anything at that time. Amen. How many? You, you, you don't. You talking about Bible. I don't know nothing about reading no Bible, but you knew you needed some help. Come on. You may not have known much about any scriptures or anything like that, but you knew you needed some help. You knew that what you were doing was not going to work out. And so what do you do? You come to the end of yourself. The best thing we can do is help people to come to the end of themselves. Now, no matter what you say to a person, you cannot make them come to the end of themselves. You could talk about them. You could tell them you need to stop this. You need to stop. That ain't helping nothing. But what you need to do is pray. Lord, I pray. I remember my pastor said this about his brother. Because my pastor got saved, but his brother didn't. And he was pushed, he was hard headed with it for a long time. My pastor prayed, Lord, shake him over hell, but just don't drop him in. <laughs> 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 Woo, that's powerful, ain't it? And how many know God did that? God shook him over hell, but he didn't drop him in. And then he messed around and woke up and got saved, you know? And so you can't bring a person like I can't bring anybody to the end of themselves. That's why, you know, we preach the truth. We don't judge and condemn anybody. You can't go out there and condemn some person and say, well, this person is in this type of sin. And so they're worse than me. The sin is sin. But you just need to be in a place where you are willing to pray that that person, because listen, when it happens for them, then now their life is changed. If they do it for you, it ain't going to stick. But when they do it, 
for themselves because they said, I have come to the end of me. I can't do this no more. You see what I'm saying? Now that's a person that is ready to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, I got to teach slowly on this because we got to make sure we are approaching this the right way. You don't go out there, man, just shooting off a machine gun of, of Jesus uh, tracks. You know the little tracks they used to pass around? That is not, you're just going out there just shooting off a machine gun. Everybody just throwing tracks at the world. Uh-huh. You can be a witness. Your greatest witness is going to be your walk. It's a transformed person. And so what you want to do is you want to be praying, especially you got loved ones, man. We got loved ones. We want them to get saved. We're like, man, Lord, I just, you know, I want them saved. Just pray for them to come to the end of themselves. And then they cry out. Because when that person cries out on their own, I mean, no, you ain't got to make them do nothing. You know, I don't have to make anyone do anything that has come to the end of themselves. Like my disciples that, you know, that's really under me, I ain't gonna make them come to church. Amen. Huh? Come on, somebody. I don't have to, come on, some of y'all been around here and you see some of these people, you say, man, they, every time I come, they here. And even when you miss, they still here. But you think, man, the Pastor Troy must be, woo, he done whipped them into shape. Ask them. But if they come to the end of themselves, oh, they're going to get the Holy Ghost. Y'all, come on. See, you, you can have mental assent and you can say, I'm going to be disciplined. That's it. This time, this is my year. How many of y'all, you know, everybody's New Year's resolutions is gone. By the time we hit April, everything you said you was going to do, it's out the window, man. You done moved on into something else. Amen? But when you could say you're going to do all this stuff, you're gonna, that's mental assent. And so actually people can mature. I've said this and I'll keep saying it. Just because you don't do the things you used to do. Oh, you know, I don't go to the club no more. I don't drink like I used to. I don't, that don't mean you like saved. That just mean you getting tired. You getting old, you getting tired. You, just, you know what I'm saying? You can't hang like that no more. Amen? Some of y'all used to hang out, man, and get like two hours of sleep. If you did that today, you'd been and passed out at work. Yeah, up on, I had two hours of sleep. You done fell out at work. Man, what happened? And then fainted. Exhaustion. <laughs> And so you say, well, pastor, you know, I'm, I'm doing a lot better today. But what's the motive behind that? You know what I'm saying? The motive for you to not do those things, drinking and doing all that stuff, your motive should be because of your love for Christ. Amen. It shouldn't be because, man, I'm tired of spending all that money. How I many know alcohol is expensive? Yeah, People start becoming budget conscious and they say, well, what? How much is that drink? <laughs> wow. <laughs> How about just a soda? <laughs> <laughs> right? But so, what I'm, I'm telling you this to, to prove a point. When, now because see, I, be, I do believe we have a problem in the body of Christ. Now, Amen. what is this problem? We have a leader which is the Holy Ghost. Amen. But you don't just get the Holy Ghost just because you walk through a church door. Mm -hmm. So, because to me, it's sometimes baffling. When I hear things, I hear about people, I say, that's great, they go to church, that's awesome. But then I start hearing about, like, character, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, wow. Oh, there's no change? Like, you know, like, I'm not trying to judge the world, but I don't know about you guys, but the Holy Ghost, man, he don't let me... He don't let me do nothing. Right. I'm just like, man, I can't even. Y'all in here, come on. The Holy Ghost won't even let me have an attitude for five minutes. Right. I get an attitude, try to be stinky for five minutes, and I'm getting checked. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. So why is that happening to me? If it ain't happening to somebody else. Wait, wait. 
you got the same Holy Ghost and he's letting you cuss and act a fool and drink and do all this stuff. And dang, he giving you that kind of pass and he don't let me do nothing. That's messed up. Oh, that's just because you're a pastor. He was on me like this before I was a pastor. Well, so sometimes we can come to a conclusion which would offend people. Y'all in here with me. Hmm. You might have a ghost. <laughs> but uh, it ain't the Holy Ghost. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Right? Why? Because let me tell you. So when you come to the end of yourself, so you come to that place, no more me. Then, whew, the Holy Ghost will come on you, man. As soon as you say, Jesus, take my life, he'll take it and boom. Yeah. See? All this learning how to be filled with the Holy Ghost, come on. Some of y'all say, well, I got to go to the Holy Ghost class before I get the Holy Ghost. I got to, you know what I'm saying, I got to go to the Holy That's some religious mumbo jumbo, man. You get, to the, you get the Holy Ghost immediately when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. Now, that's key right there. If you don't have that, if you don't confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and you're just doing some stuff because somebody getting on you about it, guess what? You, you, now, once again, some people might you know, find this to be offensive, but you can come up and say all you want at the altar. And God ain't giving out the Holy Ghost to everybody. So a lot of people walk away. They walk up to the altar and walk back to their seat. And they had an emotional experience, but never got the Holy Ghost. And so what happens? They can't quit smoking. They can't quit drinking. They can't quit cussing. You can't live this life without the Holy Ghost. It is impossible. Amen. So what will people be in a cycle of perpetual repentance? I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. And God's like, when are you going to be sorry enough to start walking right? Come on. Come on. Right. How could 120 people cause this to be a global movement? Do you understand that? There are Christians all over the world. How could this happen with 120 people? Because they had the Holy Ghost. You see what I'm saying? And it went across the world. How can we have a church today with 5,000 people? And sin is all through the church. But we started with 120 and it spread across the world. But then something happened along the way. Something called religion. And it slid in there and it gave people something to hide behind. See? And it also gave other people an excuse because they said, well, I don't really trust the church stuff because that, that last pastor I met, you know, the pastor that I had, he was this. What he got to do with the Holy Ghost? Because when you come to the end of yourself, you don't care what they do. I'll tell you right now, if everybody started acting a fool, I'm going to be like, Jesus, I'm with you. Uh, I don't care all these prominent people that were supposed to be 100. Now they, they all falling and coming out, turning out fakes. What do you think? I'm going to quit what I believe because I didn't start believing this for them. Right. I, I started believing this because you brought me to the end of myself. And so for me, there ain't no other way. I ain't got nothing to turn to. I don't care if nobody likes me at the church. I don't care if the church don't even got a building. You know, you'd be surprised what's going on. And people are like, well, you know, uh, I just really wasn't moved by the coffee shop over there. They're lacking in the coffee. What? Is that why you're doing this? See what I'm saying? We ought to be doing what we do because we came to the end of ourselves. 
Now, when you do that, what do you get? The comforter. Ooh, that, now this, this word gets powerful. Because this is the same comforter. Y'all in here with me? The same comforter that he was talking about in Acts chapter 1, 8, when he says, you will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then now you're going to be my disciples. Oh, just real quick, put up Acts 1, 8 in the King James. See, you know, all this, this ought to have a different meaning for us, man. So before we get to this 26, but Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power. That word power means deutimus, force. It's the capacity. I'm talking about this is the power you need to defeat the devil. Amen. This is the power right here. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so it's going to spread. Across the globe. I got the Holy Ghost. You know, the Holy Ghost can empower you to minister to a person that does not speak your language. Oh, y'all come. He will give you the power to lay hands on somebody and they don't even come from the same place. You, they have a different culture than you. And you can lead them into the kingdom. And they will weep and they will cry. And you guys have not spoken one word to each other that you can both understand. Y'all believe in this power. So now this is the same power. Now the same Holy Ghost. Now go back to John 14, 26. This is the same power you get. And this is why they were able to start this movement in Acts, starting in Acts chapter 2. They come up out of the upper room and they filled with the Holy Ghost, and it was just spreading across the globe. And now, for us, when a person comes to the end of themselves, and so he says that we're going, he's going to make us fishers of men. But i got to give you some understanding. See, sometimes people have misrepresented what fishing means. You know, there's some, uh, how many know, you don't just catch fish, throw them in a the bucket, and leave them in the bucket. What if you leave them in the bucket? They're going to be rotten. You got to catch them, clean them. Come on, somebody, prepare them. There's a lot of work involved in this. And that's what Jesus was talking about. But you're going to need the Holy Ghost to do this. And so he says, but the comforter, the counselor. How many of y'all ever felt like you need some counseling? Amen. Then what if you start talking about, I got a counselor on the inside of me. You know, sometimes you could be going through a rough period of life. And. Instead of rushing to call somebody, oh, come on. Instead of rushing to call somebody, I challenge you to practice this. Call on the Holy Ghost. Ooh, Lord, I, this right here is tough for me. I, can't, I don't even know how to handle this. You have a counselor on the inside of you. Then you have a helper. I mean, I need some help. But then you got the helper on the inside of you, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, a standby. Standby means he's still there. Come on, when you come into your next problem, guess who's standing by? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send uh, in my name, in my place to represent me and act on my behalf. He will teach you all things. How many things is going to teach you? So are you, you equipped for what? Everything. Everything? Everything? You know the Holy Ghost can give you answers to a test? Sure. Oh, y'all don't see. Some people don't. I use this stuff, man. I pray over a test before I take it, and the Holy Ghost give me through it. Then you get your grade, and you're like, whoo, thank you, Jesus, because <laughs> that was all you. <laughs> Now, that's not an excuse, you know, to not study. But sometimes you just may not know everything. The Holy Ghost will give you the answers. And so it says, um, and he, he will teach you all things and he will cause you to recall, will remind you, uh, uh, remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything I've told you. And so this is how the Holy Ghost does it. Now, this is what you got to understand. Now, I had to put that emphasis on the first part about when you come to the end of yourself. 
Because how I many know the Holy Ghost does not ride shotgun? Y'all in here? He don't do that. That's why sometimes to me, I be, you know, I used to pray about it, but I don't pray about it no more. I'm just like, well, okay, Lord, they doing their thing. I got to do mine. Let me just stay on track. But to me, I'm like, I don't see how people could do certain things. And they got the Holy Ghost. You know, I didn't hear some people speak in tongues and the same person start cussing. Not at the same time, though. I, now, that would, be, that would be pretty strange. That'd be jacked up right there. I'm just saying, if you got a, a, a mother in the church and they over there speaking in tongues in the corner and then on the way out and they, you heard them cussing somebody out, you'd be like, whoa. But it's the same person, though. So it's like, how are you speaking in tongues? Right. Is this, this ain't being too aggressive, is it? Or is it just, you know? I'm just, at, I'm just, you know, bringing up some things because the Jesus that I've learned about is really powerful. Really just, you know, changes lives. You know what I'm saying? He don't even let you do some things that you would have done. You see what I'm saying? You know, and it's, it's, a, it's crazy stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I told you this before, but now it happened maybe two, possibly three times where somebody, somebody coming to our church has gotten flipped off by somebody going to that church over there. Yeah. Flipped off. One of these people flipped off my mom. Yeah. I said, what? Yeah. Lord. You know, that's when you'd be like, well, did you happen to see the license plate? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, <laughs> we, we've been delivered, so we ain't doing all that. But dang, man, that's pretty messed up. Yeah. But you're going to church. Like, at least if you're going to church, you should at least be trying <laughs> to build your best behavior. I mean, you didn't even know that you was turning left into a church and you flipped a bird on somebody. Don't that look weird? So, but see, you don't get this power that I'm talking about until you come to the end of yourself. I think if, if we start preaching it right, we might have less people signing up for this. But it's going to be quality over quantity. And you'll have disciples that are actually able to duplicate. What do you want to duplicate? Do you want to duplicate lukewarm? Or do you want to multiply the fire? How many of y'all, uh, how many of y'all want to, you want to duplicate lukewarm or you want to multiply the fire? Go, uh, glory to God. I'd rather just, mul give me five people on fire in the name of Jesus. Five of us, come on somebody, we can tear up a whole city. Yes. Amen. Woo. See, that's what God's talking about. But the world is multiplying lukewarm. And Jesus, what does he say about that? He says, I wish you were hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, I'm spitting you on my mouth. Amen. All right. And so Jesus isn't just going to guide you through the life you choose. All right. This is just the truth of the gospel. This is an all or nothing kingdom that we're involved in. Jesus isn't just going to guide you through the life you choose. He is not following us. We are following him. Now let's go to Luke, Luke 9, Luke 9, 23. He says, King James, he's, he said, uh, and he said unto them, or he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? Uh, still more. Uh, and then this is important too. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his glory and in his fathers and in the holy angels. That's when he's coming back. If we're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of us. But let's look at this in the message and, and let's get into this more deeply. Uh, the message translation. 
Then he told them what they could expect for themselves. Isn't it good to set expectations? You know, I, 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 when I used to be in sales, that was a big thing we had to learn. Hey, don't try to sneak up on somebody at the end of the meeting. Set the expectations. Let them know, hey, we're going to go over this and go over that. I'm gonna, and if I meet your, you know, needs and not da da at the end, you know, we're going to go ahead and fill out the contract. That's setting expectations. Instead of, oh, I'm just here to visit. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I don't really, you know, you don't have to do nothing today. And then at the end, you're trying to do a rope adult. <laughs> you're going to get in there and get this, you know. That's... <laughs> That's why I say don't do that. To, oh, some people take that approach in church. Some of you are talking about, oh, don't worry about it. Oh, just come. Just, just try it out. Then they get in here and hear me. You can't be telling nobody to come try this church out like that. You might not mess around. And they, you might lose your friendship with that person. Oh, just come on. Oh, you just, you'll like it. Just come on. Just try it out. And then they're going to get a pastor like me. So what do you do? Set the expectations. You see what I'm saying? Don't, you know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus said, I'm tell you what y'all need to expect when you, when you do this. See, some people think that Jesus was begging people to follow him. Y'all, it's not in the Gospels. It's nowhere. Jesus never begged anybody to follow him. But he told them what's going to happen if they do follow him. And he told them what would happen if they don't. So then now they can make that decision. And so here's what he says. Then he told them what they could expect for themselves. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. Let me just set this straight with y'all. You're going to come with me. Well, before you decide to follow and jump in this thing, ain't no negotiations going on. I run this. Amen. Now, if you want to say, oh, no, don't nobody tell me what to do. Jesus will say, okay, well, you go your way. I'm going mine. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Isn't that fair to to set those expectations? But what do people do? Church is doing this. Oh, no, you just that's okay. Oh, the the God will change your heart. He'll he'll change your heart one day. No, you better repent, man. This ain't no game. Put that down. See, God, God would do stuff like that. He'd bring threats from heaven. You know what I'm saying? Like me and my wife talking about Abimelech when he tried to take uh, Abraham's wife. You think God showed up on him with some kind words? He said, you're nothing but a dead man because you got another man's wife. See, we living in this age of everything's acceptable now. You could just repent 50 times. Now you better quit playing. Your life could be required of you tonight. Ooh, ain't that a cold way to look at it? Your life could be required of you tonight. See, that'll cause some quick change in the people. Amen? And, and this is what he's saying, that Jesus set these expectations. See, that's why, hey, man, I'm not interested in church growth like that. I'm building disciples. I'm building disciples. You know what I'm saying? Come on, man. I know I've been transformed, but like when I wasn't saved, I wasn't trying to have a whole bunch of friends. Ain't none of y'all, none of y'all could fight. (laughs) Man, I got 10, 10 busters with me, man. And we all getting hemmed up. Give me, come on. I just need three soldiers. That's all y'all in. Some of y'all can get with me on this. I don't, you don't need to be just recruiting a whole bunch of people that's soft, can't do nothing. Just give me like two or three of them. We can just, we can go in on them. Huh? I said different level, man. You know, you learn that growing up. You start learning like, man, I didn't. Been around some people just yapping. They just talking. The first one to get slept. Yep. Yep. Y'all, some of y'all don't know what get slept means. <laughs> yeah. Amen. But I'm just saying, we don't need a whole bunch of people. And half of them ain't even committed. That ain't what Jesus was building. He was letting them know out the gate. 
If you're not going to go 100, I'm, <laughs> I'm the wrong one to follow. There's probably going to be some other people that will come along, and you can follow them. But Jesus told them what they could expect for themselves. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. And then he says, don't run from suffering. Now stop right here. This is where Christians blow it. Everything ain't going well for you. Oh, you got a trial. You got a test. But the word says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tests. For it's the testing of your faith that produces patience. God will allow you to go through something to squeeze that extra something out of you that he don't want in you no more. But when everything is going your way, you stay the same. And so you don't run from it. You say, oh, Lord. Stick out my chest. Keep going forward. See, we don't run from opposition. We run right into it. Amen. And you come out on the other side of that. Purified and refined. Ready for the next challenge. You see what I'm saying? That's a different way of looking at it. So he says, and she put the scripture up, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be entire wanting nothing. So you can't be entire wanting nothing if you don't go through some things. And so you, there's a little challenge here or there. We don't abandon it. We don't say, oh, I guess God didn't hear me. I guess my prayers aren't working. Come on, man. Uh, yeah, you know what I'm saying? We do, so we realize this is like, this is the, the way to, to live. So it says, don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Y'all see that? Yeah. Embrace it. How many of y'all been happy about a trial? See, that's hard. So, ooh, thank you. I'm embracing this. It's mad. Yeah. Dang, that's a different kind of person. Like, man, this is heavy. Ooh, this don't feel good, but let me go. I'm going to embrace this. I take ownership of this. Wow. What kind of gospel is this? It's the gospel that Jesus preached. It ain't this new day gospel. This, it ain't this new day gospel where you can go get a secular artist and have him put them on your album. Come on, you can do a concert with a secular. What? You're not getting on this stage, man. You know what I'm saying? There's so much of this. You know, Christian artists and Christian people, and they're participating in all the worldly things. And there's no righteous standard established. That's not what Jesus preached. And so he says, don't run from suffering, embrace it. Follow me. And what's he going to do? I'll show you how. So you say, man, this, that seems tough, Jesus. But then if he says, don't worry about it, I got you. How many of y'all would say, okay. You trust his ability to show you. He'll be able to show you what you need to know in every single situation. Next verse. Oh, yeah. Look at this. What, this ought to be something you write down, man. We are also in the age of self-help. Self-help. What are you going to do? Get, your, get on a diet. Start thinking positive thoughts. Get you some positive affirmations. Get you this. Get you that. All this stuff to build up yourself. But what does Jesus say? Self-help is no help at all. Wait, huh? Self-sacrifice. Oh, Pastor, I was going to come to church, you know, but uh, church was at 10. That ain't even early. Wait till we go on two services. Some of y'all are going to have to come at 8. Some of y'all are like, that's out. I ain't in that one. <laughs> Pastor, gonna, he know he's going to get somebody else for that. But think about it. Self-sacrifice is the way. My way. This is Jesus saying Self-sacrifice. So self-help is no help at all. Uh, 
self-sacrifice is the way, my way to finding yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? Stop right there. How many times does that happen? How many people say, you know, they have reached that place of fame or wealth or whatever, and they're not happy? And they are uh, dependent upon medication just to get through the day. All this type of stuff. Well, Jesus is saying, what good would it do to get everything you want and lose the real you? See what I'm saying? Next verse. Uh, if any of you is embarrassed with me. Now, some of you say, well, I just, you know. I just keep my Christianity to myself. OK. If any of you is embarrassed with me and my and the way I'm leading you. Know that the son of man will be far more embarrassed with you when he arrives in all his splendor in company with the father and the holy angels. This isn't. You realize pie in the sky, you know, pie in the sky by and by. Some who have taken their stand right here are going to see it happen. See when their own eye, see with their own eyes, the kingdom of God. And so this thing is coming. This is building up to a time to where we're all, you know, this world we live in is not our home. So we don't let this world govern us. And so now what I what I want to emphasize is. He says self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way to finding yourself your true self. And so now we live in a self-serving world. That's what this world is about. We live in a self-serving world. But he's clearly telling us self-sacrifice is the way. And so uh, because that is the key principle in the kingdom of God, self-sacrifice. What did Jesus do? Sacrifice himself. So if we say my life is not my own now, let me help you with this. God has a plan. He knows what he put in you. He wants to use you. And so self-sacrifice doesn't mean that all of us say, forget the world. All we're going to do is go to church every day. Well, guess what? You come here every day. I won't be here. You're not going to get in. And you'll see on the door. Oh, they're back open on Wednesday. Because we have life. We influence the world. We don't just all of a sudden everybody says, oh, well, if this self-sacrifice and all this kingdom stuff, then, man, I'm going to have to figure out, I'm going to have to be a pastor or a worship leader. I'm going to have to get in there. No. You think 120 people influence the entire world by staying in the church? They went out into the world and this Christianity that we become involved in. God is going to anoint you to have influence in all arenas. How I many know we're taking over all, what do they call it? The seven mountains. Yeah. We're taking over everything, man, media and uh, just everything. School system. How I many know God needs Christian teachers in schools? I don't know, everybody complaining, well, you know, they're just teaching our kids everything that's not about God. How about we get some Holy Ghost filled teachers up in there and how many know you can represent the kingdom of God and that can be an influence that can change and bring and they won't be able to stop the revival. Amen. They won't be able to stop the revival. See, the answer for us is not running from the world. That is not the answer. I'm, that's it. I got to get out of this job because there's no Christians over here. What about you? Right. Sounds like a, a, a mission field right there to me. Sounds like you can build some disciples yeah. at your job. Man, I did I, everything I'm telling you. I did it. I built disciples in my workplace. Teaching them scriptures, teaching all that type of you don't have to become a pastor to be in God's work. He's going to use you. He needs Christians everywhere. Come on. How many know he needs Christians in uh, every field, whatever teachers, doctors, lawyers. Come on. How many know, man, yeah. Amen. 
Well, the legal system is this way and that way. That's why God will plant a kingdom citizen up in there so that now he can bring the kingdom into that place. See, we influence everything, every arena, everywhere we go. And guess what? You're going to have divine opportunities. God's going to, if you're open to it, God will put you in front of people. The next thing you know, you are ministering to them. Come on. What, I mean, what would happen if you went to your doctor and you wasn't saved? And the doctor, you told the doctor what was going on. And the doctor said, hey, let me pray for you first. That would trip you out, huh? But you know that's happening. Hmm? It's happening. Oh, and then you got people that they, they, they think they're scared. You know, well, I can't say anything at school because the school district. I mean, oh, the kingdom overrides that district. There's a greater power. That district can't stop the kingdom of God. See, this is what happened. This is how the gospel was spreading. It, they were taking over the world. And they were meeting people where they were. And then guess what? Somebody would come and get touched by God's power and then. Go back. Jesus often told him, go back. Go back and tell your family. Go back. Why? Because that influence is going to spread. Amen. And so but now we've got to understand. That if we're in a world that's a self-serving world, we want to go against that because the key principle in the kingdom of God is self-sacrifice. So we want to say, here I am, Lord. Do whatever you want to do with me. I'm yours. I'm not my own. Now go to Matthew. Because uh, self-sacrifice opens the door to kingdom empowerment. Self-sacrifice opens the door to kingdom empowerment. And so now he says, um, Matthew 4, let's go back to Matthew, well, I think we went there. Matthew 4, 19, 20 in the message. Jesus said, this is that scripture we're reading again. Jesus says, come with me and I'll make you a new kind of fisherman. So these guys were fishers, but now he says, I'm going to make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch what? And women instead of perching bass. Y'all see that? Jesus said, I'm going to show you how to catch men and women. That's powerful. And they didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed him. So I'm going to show you how to catch men and women. And so now we start to understand this. This is greater than just saying a prayer for someone to be saved. I've got to emphasize this through this message. I think that's why we're in the problem we're in as a church, not just this church. I'm talking about the church in general. Is people have forgotten the important parts of what Jesus was teaching. See, this is not <clears throat> just praying for someone to be saved. This is about discipleship. This is about discipleship. Go to Matthew, Matthew 28. 18 through 20 in the message. So Jesus, undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. Go, or excuse me, God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out and stop right there. What does that say? So who are you training? Oh, man. So who's he, is this? Think about this. Have you ever looked at yourself as, oh, man, I actually train people how to follow Jesus. Not just your own house, not just your kids, but this is a mandate that he puts on you. This is how the gospel spreads. Go out and train everyone. See, what has happened is some people have been trained to go to church so that they could check off a little church thing. But they haven't been trained. They're like, wait, hold on. The church is just, you know, don't be just focused on the building. Focus on the life. Focus on how you live. Go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this what? Way of life. So this is a way of life. In this way of life, marking them by baptism in the threefold name, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then, y'all see this? Instruct them, what's practice mean? That's continual. It's something you do continue. So it says, then instruct them in the practice of all I have commanded you. 
I'll be with you as you do this day after day, right up to the end of the age. And so what does he say? Teach them. So you go out there, but then now you're going to be a witness, but now you're going to teach them. He says, I'm going to teach you how to catch men and women. You catch them, but then you teach them. You teach them to do what you're doing. And you help them in this way of life. This is not just a passing fad or a feeling or emotion. It's like, I'm going to help you walk this out. See, what if God uses you to reach out to someone and you say, okay, brother, I'm, I'm going to pray for you. Are you ready? Are you at the end of your life? You at the end of yourself? You ready to give your life over to Jesus? Okay, most definitely. Let's pray. You pray. They say the sinner's prayer, and you say, oh, hallelujah, you're saved, and then you go on down the street. That's not what Jesus did. No, you pray for him, and you say, let me get your phone number. Oh, see, come on, y'all. Let me get your phone number, man. Well, what you need, because I, I, I'm about to train you how to walk. <laughs> what if we start doing that? Instead of these little drive-by prayers and stuff. People are just uh, okay, boom, you're saved. Go ahead. Go where? Yeah. Like you just basically you just led me in a prayer that said, I gave up everything I know. So where am I going back to? And so we must be willing to invest in people. We must be willing to go the distance with them. Once again, don't just say a prayer with them and expect them to make it. How many? How many of y'all would have made that? You just went up there and said a prayer. You know, I know I got saved, if you want to call it that, in 1994. I said a sinner's prayer. But you know what I kept doing after I was saved? I kept sinning. Mm -hmm. Kept drinking. Kept, you know what I'm saying? You know why? I wasn't discipled. So if you ask me, I would probably say, I might not have made it. Wait, but you went up to that altar call and you had those emotions and, you know, uh, all that stuff. Yeah. But what I do after that? So what I did after that, I went back to, but see, in that church that I was in, they was teaching the Bible, but they wasn't teaching about the power of the Holy Ghost. They wasn't teaching that you ain't going to make this on your own. Come on, somebody. You need to be fire baptized. You need the Holy Ghost to take over you and consume you. They weren't teaching that. The pastor was saying stuff like, well, you know, I don't drink, but, you know, ain't no but. I'm going to tell you, I don't drink and you don't need to be drinking either. In the name of Jesus, you need to quit that. Amen. Quit playing with God. Ain't nobody got time for you. Talking about sipping on this and that. Get out of here with that. This is the kingdom of God we're talking about. This is the power of the Holy Ghost we're talking about. We're talking about taking over the world. Amen. We ain't talking about you trying to see how much sin you can keep and still be saved. Amen. Well, I'm offended. You ain't offended if you, still, if you would have quit drinking a long time ago. You wouldn't be offended today. Been around me long enough, you already know you ain't supposed to be doing that. But think about it. This is Jesus we're talking about. Didn't Jesus set the expectations? Didn't he say something like, let me just let you know what you should expect. I read the scripture to you. When you come over here, I'm in the driver's seat. Didn't he say that? So can't nobody come to me and tell me, well, pastor, you know, Jesus led me to the club. He did. You see what I'm saying? And so, now why do I have to emphasize this stuff? Because we're going to have a lot of people trying to, you know, do a little church thing on Easter. But this is all about transformation. This is about God getting a hold of your life. And I've never had anybody that said I gave my life to Jesus and I regret it. Nobody's ever come to me and said that. Everybody that's given their lives to Jesus, it's better. They're living better. And so we must be willing to help people. Don't just say a prayer with them and expect them to make it. It's just like a newborn baby, right? You wouldn't take a newborn baby and after they're born, cleaned up, and then you just send them, okay, all right, be blessed. Go in the favor of the Lord. They can't do anything. That's the way Christians are when they first get saved. They don't, they don't know stuff. They need some help. 
And so we've got to be willing to commit to the process. Now, let me tell you this before we close. Your success is dependent upon your willingness to help others succeed. Amen. This is a key to the kingdom, if you could learn this. And I've tried to share this with disciples of mine. I say, hey, man, you know, you got to get somebody that you're pouring into. Because now when you start pouring into that person, that's when your stuff starts getting better. See, that's a key to the kingdom. Remember, self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is what's required. Now, when you start to do that, you say, oh, man, I didn't really feel like going to church today, but I forgot I got brother so-and-so and they depended on me and they watching my every move. And so let me go ahead and show up. Yeah. See, when you can just haphazardly do this and you could be just waving and all that type, you, nobody's looking at you. And so you don't you're not held accountable. So the only thing that can keep you pressing is if the pastor's got his thumb on you. I'm not the pastor to do that. But if you start knowing other. Uh huh. Um, why y'all think you, you think I'm, what would you guys do if I just I just didn't come. I'm tired, man. I'm not coming. What would you guys do if you came to church and I wasn't here and there was no explanation? Would you be just sitting up in there looking at the podium? You'd be like, uh, okay, uh, hmm. But you have an expectation. Well, you know what? That helps me because I have to show up. And if I'm out of town on vacation or doing something, I got to make sure I have somebody who I have appointed to be in this position so that when you come, that you're always going to be fed, Amen. that you're always going to have something that's going to challenge you and cause you to go forward. What happens when you also now take on that responsibility? So, oh, no, maybe you're not the one up in here preaching, but others need to see you. I tell you what, you start getting, I challenge you. I'm challenging anybody to get five people that's following them. That's a challenge. Let me tell you about I got five kids. No. Well, get five people to follow you. What could happen? What, what, what kind of, anybody up in here with me? What kind of influence could you have if you have five people that's heavily dependent on you to keep your walk with Christ right? And you know you can't let them down. Amen? What do you think that's going to do for you? See, the key to your success is helping someone else succeed. That's what works. That's what's going to cause the problems that you've been dealing with. That's going to give you victory over them. But you've got to commit to the success of someone else. So let's confess this and we're going to close out. I want you to say it and say it like you mean it. Matter of fact, let's stand up. We're going to stand up on this thing. Because I'm releasing power off this altar. And, and you got to believe it. Amen. You got to believe in the power of God. And believe that you're valuable and precious to him. All right. Let's, let's confess this. Say, I am a soul winner. I am a soul winner. And a disciple maker. And a disciple maker. People see the kingdom of God in me. And they, are compelled to follow Jesus. and they are compelled to follow Jesus. I am anointed to lead, I am anointed to lead. And, influence and influence others for the cause of Christ. Y'all believe that? Amen. So you just said, come on, clap for Jesus. You just said <laughs> that you're a soul winner. So we're going to win them in, but then we're going to train them. Amen. Amen. We're not doing no drive by. Come on. We're not going to drive by and give them a little drive by prayer. You know, that's why sometimes going on outreach, go to the park, do the little. That's good. But what's better is you stay with them. Right. Is you help them. You call them tomorrow. Call them in two days. Oh, you need something? Come on. You need some food? Oh, y'all. Huh. Can I help you? Hey, matter of fact, why don't you go with me over here to this and go pick them up. Don't just say, meet me here. 
How many times do you tell people to meet you here and they don't come? Brother, what are you talking about? I'm outside. Where? Outside of your house. Let's go. You ready? Let me do what you need. Five minutes. <laughs> That's where we're heading, church. So remember, Easter's coming up next week. You could be praying about that now. Lord, I know you got some. I know. Listen, I challenge all of you right now. Just, just say this out loud. Say, Lord, I know you got at least five disciples for me. Put that on God and watch what happens. And it's going to happen and you're going to start influencing lives. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Y'all believe it? Amen. Clap for Jesus. Amen. So on your way out, tell three people, I know God's got five disciples for me. And so this, let this thing come alive and then we all. And how many know if the Holy Ghost is doing it, it doesn't matter if you're shy. Because the Holy Ghost is doing it. And remember, that's going to be the key to your success, helping others to succeed. Amen. Praise the Lord. What? I didn't do it. OK, uh, I'm uh, saying they're looking at me. Yeah. Well, praise God. Let's pray for some folks to get saved. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that we can come and we can pray. Maybe you're watching us right now. Maybe you're here and you don't know Jesus as Lord. Well, today will be a great day for you to open your heart. If you open your heart, he'll gladly receive you. But you got to open your heart and you got to do this as a person who knows what they're doing. Nobody's forcing you. This is an invitation simply offered to you. If you're here, you've never received Jesus as Lord. Go ahead and wave your hand at me. I'll pray for you. And if you're at home. Wave your hand. God will see you and he'll receive you. Church, let's repeat this prayer so that anyone who hears this message will know how to receive Jesus as Lord. Repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus. please forgive me for all of my sins. I commit my life into your hands. This day, I am saved. Do with me as you please. And fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. Clap for the Lord. Amen.